Well, <laughs> this was absolutely ridiculous. Also, hello, my friends. Welcome to Ups and Downs for Forbidden Door. And just to get some housekeeping out of the way, make sure you go watch Ups and Downs for AEW Collision. Because, of course, today was the first time we did the Ups and Downs for that show on a Monday. And then there was a pay-per-view. And you want to know why? because wrestling will never die. But as we already knew, AEW Forbidden Door did kick off with MJF versus Tanahashi for the AEW World Championship. And as I said on Collision Ups and Downs, sure, Tanahashi can't really move anymore because he's destroyed his knees, but what he lacks for in mobility, he makes up with star power and aura and atmosphere. I mean, as soon as he walks out, he just goes, man, who's that guy? Well. MJF is also a mega dick, so he was mocking Tanahashi's guitar stuff. And on the back of his robe, it said basically New Japan, what a crappy promotion, it may as well be an indie. Obviously, it didn't say that, because that would be well too long, but this was the intent. I love that guy. Friedman then played to the fact the crowd were going, you're a cowhood, by literally using the referee as a human shield. But Tanahashi was having none of this, and he just started to beat up this guy, and it was just a feel-good moment. But he worked over Maxwell so much, his knees started to weaken. <laughs> so do you know what Maxwell did eventually? He went hop and he spat in Tanahashi's face. I was like, you can't do that. He'd be like, hocking a loogie at your granddad. Max then continued this by poking him in the eye, because again, he is a massive dick. But when he got torn away by posing to the crowd, Tanahashi was like, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hit you with the dragon screw. You see? Wrestling's so simple. MGF then decided he was going to get the AEW World title and use it as a weapon. But the ref was like, oh, you can't do that. Why do you make my life so miserable? When Tanahashi hit the most devastating move in all the spots, entertainment with a surprise roll up, and he actually had a visual pinfall over the champion. But that means diddly squat in wrestling, so it didn't count. It also meant that MGF was able to get the dynamite diamond ring, realized nobody was looking at him, and he clocked Tanahashi right in the face, and he pinned him for the one, two, three. And this is exactly what we should have done. Tanahashi is a legend, you've got to protect him. But Maxwell Jacob Friedman is your champion, so you've got to protect him too. And it did tie right into his character, which apparently I'm holding here in my hand. This is not possible. Great start. Up. Which is also true for match number two, CM Punk versus Kojima. What reality am I living in? There's also a first round matchup in the Owen Hart Cup. And once again, much like we said on AEW Collision Ups and Downs, because we were in Toronto, Punk came out and some people were cheering, but a lot of people were booing. But he just leaned right into this. And dare I said, one, I think I prefer him as a somewhat bad guy. Two, you can't deny it, he's such a star and he's a damn good wrestler. Kojima also started this by hip tossing Punk. And I was like, wait a minute, Kojima. In your promo for this match, didn't you say you wanted to kill CM Punk? And you thought you could achieve this with a hip toss. I look at a lot of news bulletins and I've never seen that. We then got into the chops because of course we did when Punk chucked Kojima over Timmy the Timekeeper's table. And then again, much like he had done on Saturday night, given that we were in Toronto, he cut the ear and he hit the leg drop. <laughs> look, talking about it from a TV perspective, I'm so happy he's back. This continued because when he was slugging Kojima in the corner, he just went lariat. Lariat, Kojima, Kojima, and honestly, please continue to play into this. But you can't do that to the Japanese legend, because he got pissed off and he just went crazy with the machine gun chops. Because of course he did. Punk soon returned with the Anaconda device, but Kojima got out of that by just smashing him in the head. And when he went for the GTS, do you know what Kojima did? He busted his brain with a brain buster. He only got a two. Now, of course, I'm not sure anybody thought that Kojima would actually win this, and it would have been ridiculous if he had done, so eventually he did get GTS 1, 2, 3. Not only should Punk win the Owen Hart Cup, but in the final, he should properly screw somebody over so you know that he is a bad guy. Although here he did raise Kojima's hand because once again, he's a legend too. This was such a good one to start to the show, and I sat there and I thought to myself, yep, I'm pumped. I was talking to myself, up. And it continued with the next match too. I mean, my word. Because I think somebody had gone, have we had enough crazy yet? Do you think that we should go crazier? So then Mr. Crazy arrived and everybody went crazy. Because it was Orange Cassidy versus Shibata versus Zack Sabre Jr. versus Daniel Garcia. It was just a roller coaster ride. I mean, maybe they'd been told they only had 10 minutes or so, but it was just move, 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 go, go, go. It's like being on some kind of sexual roller coaster. 
Shouldn't have said it. We also started with Orange's weak kicks when Cassidy also did a dive, when everyone else decided to play the submission game. And I was like, you can't do that with Zack Sabre Jr. He'll come up with like the Duck Lock Pain 9000, and all of a sudden you'll be tied up like a quack quack and you won't know what's going on. Shibata and Sabre then wanted to smack the crap out of Daniel Garcia, so he just started dancing instead. And that's where once again I was like, man, I'm just having the best time. Why does everybody moan about wrestling? Just sit back and enjoy it. We also got four people hitting big boots simultaneously, basically, so we had a quadruple down. I'm not sure I've ever seen that before. When we got back to the submissions and we got back to the slaps, when all of a sudden Garcia and Orange Cassidy applied double sleepers, so they were trying to kill him. It was proper suplex city after this, because we got so many of them, when all of a sudden Orange Cassidy hit the stun dog millionaire, and then people were just being thrown into rear of the ring post. This is what I started doing. I don't even know why. I just didn't know what else to do. Tabata had taken his Phoenix down at this point, though, so all of a sudden he was back and he was no-selling everything. And basically, the finish was your traditional sports entertainment finish, but who cares? Because everybody could have claimed to have had the victory here, but Shibata had the biggest claim because he smacked Daniel Garcia with the PK kick. When Oran saw this and thought, well, look, I am injured. I have had about 72,989 title defenses. Why don't I get rid of him and hit, essentially, the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, which he did. One, two, three. Sabre and Shibata post-match two also held up their titles, as did Orange. And there was essentially a theme here of you didn't beat me and I didn't beat you. And Zack Sabre especially was like, oh, man, you piece of fruit. We're not done. Which I think means this is going to continue. Let me just search my feelings. I'm perfectly fine with it. Uh, which is when my prediction came true, and it was perfect. For the IWGP heavyweight title was on the line between Jungle Boy and Sonada. My favorite part about this buildup was each individual said to the other, I don't really know who you are. I like it. Jack Perry really wanted to win, so he applied the snare trap almost instantly. And when Sonata bell to the outside, Jungly Jim was a bit like, you do know I understand it's 2023 wrestling. And he hit him with a dive. Back in the ring, the champ then did apply the paradise lock, though, as all the fans went crazy. When Jack thought he had a great idea, he's like, oh, our moves aren't working. Why don't I try and outpunch this guy? It totally failed. He got killed. We were then getting Tiger Drivers, although that was nothing like the Tiger Driver we were going to get later. And of course, Sonata was trying to break some necks with the neck breaker. And look, I don't think anybody actually thought that Jungle Boy was going to become the IWGP champion. But that was not the point of this match. Because eventually, Sonata just did hit his moonsault. And that was a little bit of a flat finish. Because while he has won with this move in the past, I don't think this audience was expecting it. But look, he walked away going, hooray, I'm still the champion. Champion. And as Hook, Jungle Boy's best friend and the man with the wonderful hair, had come out with his buddy, he raised his hand, he was like, it's gonna be okay, don't worry about it. But I think in this moment, Perry was like, man, I still haven't won a damn championship. You've got one, and he smashed Hook right in the head. Jungle Boy went heel. There's also this great moment on commentary because Taz was freaking out because, of course, Hook was his son. And, man, everybody booed Jungle Boy and he totally loved it. You could see on his face. Maybe I even spied a wry smile. He also held up the FTW title before he hurled it in Hook's face and hopefully didn't damage his hair. And not only do I think this program is going to be great, but I think AEW has timed this heel turn perfectly. It's going to do the world of good with Jack and I think he's going to smash it was kind of funny, because Sonata, all people, was an afterthought here. Just wasn't your night, kid. Uh, this is what I noticed that the pay-per-view had a pattern, and it was essentially, can we just <laughs> keep increasing the madness? And the answer was yes. Because it was time for the Elite versus the BCC, and like for a lot of matches from this point on, I don't even know what I can tell you. What we can get into is that there was a little bit of story here between Eddie Kingston and John Moxley, because whereas Ed still has love for his dude, I don't think Mox cares anymore. Also, Taz was still super duper upset during this thing, and I was like, man, that's a nice touch. Otherwise, though, Claudio Castagnoli could tell Eddie Kingston wasn't in a good mood, so kind of backed off from him. When Adam Page and Shota Amuno went at 100 miles an hour, whereas Ishii and Takeshita kind of slowed things down and just walloped each other. Just you wait. The Young Bucks soon got into and did their thing, and I swear people forget just how good they are. They were flying around the place and hitting everything like wrestling isn't hard. I was like, man, I don't get how you do it. This is when Kingston and Mox got into it properly because they were chopping each other. And it was a bit like former lovers that have fallen out, but they still love each other. It revved up everybody else on the outside. Because if you did look to the floor, 
they were just having a big brawl. Hangman Adam Page did his moonsault to the outside. And I was like, how is anyone meant to keep an eye on all of this? But that was the point. Dario then returned to get a cheap shot in on Kingston. This is when Moxie could have taken advantage when he didn't. Well, I think Takeshi decided, I don't like that Ishii. And he hit him so hard, I honestly thought he was dead. He just crumpled up on the floor. It really made me laugh. I don't think they know wrestling isn't real. Ishii still came to and somehow leveled Claudio with a brain buster because he thinks thinking is bad. When Umino was doing his thing, Moxie was doing his thing, and the Young Bucks were doing their thing. It's an absolute roller coaster of joy. The Kesta then got triple super kicked, although he did get out of the way with the BTE trigger and everybody came smashing together. And I want to let you know that all happened in about 3.2 seconds. When they went to super kick Moxley, but for some reason Eddie Kingston felt bad for his buddy, so he essentially took the bullet. Uh -oh. This caused so much chaos that Takeshita was in there, and he hit the least devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the Blue Thunderbomb. And of course the person kicked out, because it's the Blue Thunderbomb and it really, really wins. Nick Jackson then somehow stopped Claudio and Wheeler Utah from doing the rocket launcher in mid-launch. I was like, I don't think you want to do that, it's dangerous. When I'm pretty sure they just got out the wrestling maneuver book and decided, shall we just do all of them? And the answer was yes. The important part though is that Kingston eventually smashed Castagnoli with his back fist, which is when Moxie decided, no, I think winning is more important than whatever we've had in the past. And he slammed him with a cutter. Damn it. Wheels then dodged the buckshot lariat, which was pretty cool, but very sadly it meant he wasn't watching Ishii, who came in. He hit the big old brain buster and he got the one, two, three. This is just so damn easy to watch. Now, I don't know what it means going forward from here, especially because Wheeler Yuta keeps losing and that's going to piss off Brian Danielson. I don't have to worry about that. I'm on the BCC. I can be a goober and nobody cares. Up. The joy continued too because the AEW Women's Championship was then on the line. Willow Nightingale versus Tony Storm. They just had a good match. Now it is broken record time again because at no point did I think Willow was going to win the title because it wasn't the time. And also, given that the outcasts were on the outside of the ring, I was like, Wills, why didn't you bring Sky Blue with you? They've got to learn. Thankfully, she kind of got the better on the outcast at first because she never meant to make them cry. But eventually, their casting distraction did work and Tony Storm got on top. I wanted to go and have with the word with the referee because I could see this coming and why couldn't they? Storm then decided she was going to pile drive Willow Nightingale onto the ring apron, which is the hardest part of the ring. Nightingale was like, no, nah, that doesn't sound like a good idea. So she DVD'd the champ instead. I was like, this card, everybody is trying to cause death. Willow then hit another one of these when the referee saw that the outcast had thrown a spray cane can to Tony Storm when he finally went, actually, Soraya and Ruby, maybe you have to leave. I wanted to go up to them again and say, yes, you could have done this 10 minutes ago. It did lead to the best false finish ever, though, because Nightingale went for the moonsault she missed when Tony Storm just went DDT, 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 DDT. But the ref went one and the ref went two and Nightingale kicked out. And all right, maybe I just had the small glimmer of hope. You always had this great moment when Willow fought back into it and just pounced Tony out of the ring. But Storm knows what she's doing and I think she was a bit panicked here. So she, too, literally used the ref as the human shield. When she tossed him aside, she poked Willow right in the eyes, which is not in the rules, by the way. Gave her the Storm Zero, one, two, three. Because I'm a massive nerd. Once again, I was like, where are you, Sky Blue? Your ass should be here. It doesn't really matter, though, because these shenanigans did make sense, and this feud continues on, and I think it's been very well put together. Up. Which is when it did begin again. Ludicrous times 9,000. Because it was Will Ospreay versus Kenny Omega round two for the US title. And everybody had said when they did round one at Wrestle Kingdom, they were holding some stuff back. I tell you, we definitely got it here. And it tied into that match. These two are not human. They're from some kind of wrestling planet where if you're not the best wrestler ever, you die. They were going after their finishes right away where Will Ospreay was so desperate to be the bad guy. He just walked up to Ken and went boop and he poked him in the eye. But it did work, and towards the end of this match, oh my gosh, flubbed me sideways. Kenny Omega was the most over guy ever. Now Don Callis was at ringside too, so he started to grab Omega's leg, and thankfully this ref had learned from all the other matches and said, right, Donny boy, you need to go to the back. Can you not see that we have a five-star classic not in the Tokyo Dome about to happen, and you're gonna ruin it? And he left. This actually didn't serve Omega at all though, because Will Ospreay grabbed him and just destroyed him in Simba the Steel Steps. 
Like, these two guys don't hold back. <laughs> surprise, surprise, Kenny Omega was bleeding. They were then just doing all of these reversals, which eventually saw Kenny Omega hit the Katara Crusher. But then they were on the ring apron when Osprey hit an Oz Cutter into the hardest part of the ring. And once again, they just did this so effortlessly. I was weak at my knees because it doesn't make any sense and my brain was freaking out. Osprey then decided that he wanted revenge, given that Kenny had tried to destroy his skull using some wood at Wrestle Kingdom. So he too got a table and oh my gosh, <laughs> you have never seen anything so violent and brutal in your life within a sports entertainment realm where you're meant to be working with the other guy. But I tell you, it takes your emotional gland and you just plug in. The blood was still flowing at this point, so Will Ospreay went and licked it. And I was like, what are you? Some kind of vampire cat? That was disgusting. Omega did try to fight back, but eventually he did that wonderful thing where he falls down because he is so destroyed. But Will was having none of this, so he hit him with a V-trigger. And if you can believe it, we were only just getting going. So Osprey decided he really wanted to heal it up and he got the Canadian flag. Let's just say he kind of desecrated it. But this really annoyed Omega, who is Canadian, and he just started to choke him with the flag. And I was like, yep, that's attempted murder. Well, Osprey's head was then also going into Simba the Steel Step, as well as Kenny DDTing him into those things. And surprise, surprise, the blood was then flowing from his body too, because as I've already told you, this is how humans work. The German suplexes then got busted out, and every single one was worse than the last, because everybody was falling on their necks. When Kenny eventually did hit a V-trigger, Will Ospreay didn't like it, so he turned it into a sharpshooter. That's right, a sharpshooter in Canada, you do the maths. This led to Oz cutter number two, so Omega just cut him off in midair. When he remembered, oh yeah, I really like Street Fire, and he did a combo. I mean, there was Poison Runners and there were Spike Pile Drivers, but much like back in January, Will Ospreay just wouldn't stay down. I think they may be two of the best wrestlers ever. I then realised it had been 30 minutes, but it did not feel like it at all when all of a sudden the Liger bombs were here. But you are not going to believe the last five minutes of this match. And I kid you not, I don't know how Kenny Omega is still alive. So Don Callis was back out, but apparently the ref didn't care. And he did pass the screwdriver to Will Ospreay. When Omega was about to hit the one-winged angel, you know what Will did. He took this thing and went doink and smacked him in the head. It also led to the hidden blade and the stormbreaker. But the ref went one and the ref went two. And at the very last second, Kenny got his foot on the ropes. You have never heard an eruption like it. It was like a volcano. This got even better too, because Osprey was then like, all right, I'm going to hit you with the one wing of angel, which he did. And do you know what Kenneth did? He kicked out at one. Honestly, you've got to go and see it. Please listen to me. It's so damn fun. They were encountering their finish for the 78th time, but given that Kenny Omega had been hit in the head with a murder weapon. It was always going to catch up to him and to make a long story and turn it a little bit shorter. He got hit with the hidden blade, which looked disgusting. He got hit with the stormbreaker, which also looked disgusting. And Will Ospreay pinned him for the one, two, three. He is the US champion again. We also have to talk about the Tiger Driver 91 <laughs> that Will Ospreay did on Kenny Omega, where he just dropped it right on his neck. This is a scared laugh. Seriously, let's bring it down for one second. I genuinely hope he's okay. It's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I have to look in the mirror. Nobody else could pull this off though. And it doesn't even matter that they're one for one, which means we're gonna get another match at either All In or maybe the next Wrestle Kingdom. Because it's just so fantastic to watch. Everybody is victorious to the point, you know the deal. It doesn't just get an up, it gets a golden up. If you consider yourself any kind of wrestling fan, you owe it to yourself to watch this. It is also kind of true for what came next. So AEW clearly decided, well, we have to bring the fans down a little bit. So out came Chris Jericho, Suzuki, <laughs> and Sammy Guevara to take on Sting, Darby, Allen, and Naito. <laughs> Can you say chaos? Because they can. This was a train wreck in the best possible way. I mean, think what we got too, because it started off with Sammy versus Nio. Then it was Darby versus Suzuki, and we got a standoff between Jericho and Sting. And then later on, we had Suzuki and Sting going on it. I was like, man, I'm in the Phantom Zone. I swear Guevara was just trying to kill Sting too. And this is what I mainly want to talk about. Because at one point, Chris Jericho said to Sam, right, set up that table. Get to the top. And I want you to hit your 630 centon onto the icon. I was like, man, it's quite old now. I don't think we should do it. Now, if I were to guess, I would presume that the Stinger was meant to get off this table because he certainly tried. But he was a little bit late. Sammy Guevara crushed this 61, 62-year-old man. It's crying. It's crying side. And it happened earlier too. 
Mega Farmer broke up the Scorpion Deathlock. Steve <laughs> just got beaten up. Honestly, he is the hero of heroes. He's a real life Batman. How does he do it? There was even more evidence to this because all of a sudden Jericho was locking on the walls of Jericho and Steve was just back up from this death and he was breaking it up. And yeah, look, the finish was kind of goofy because essentially everybody beat up Suzuki when Naito was like, oh great, I can hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment and he pinned him. I was like, that's what we chose to do as a finish, but I don't think it matters. You were meant to focus on everything else. Of course, Jericho came in with his bat afterwards and he smacked Naito, so Sting chased Jericho off with the bat. And in the post press conference afterwards, Jericho was like, ah, oh, I want a tag match, a tornado tag match, which I think we're doing on Dynamite. So I can't lie, even though it was totally, totally bonkers. It's just a joy. It's so much fun to watch. This whole card was great, although it was too long, I admit that. Up. And just to top it all off, Flood Me, our main event, lived up to all expectations as far as I'm concerned. Brian Danielson versus Akada. Give it to me. Amazingly, too, even though there was some all time stuff throughout this show, do you know what the best part was? When Brian Danielson was coming out, and like 48 hours after the song The Final Countdown rights had been sold, Tony Khan licensed it and the American Dragon came out to it. I was so damn happy. As ever, some individuals like to go, well, nobody's going to understand this. Well, 14,000 people in the building did. I did. The internet did. It properly made you feel warm and fuzzy in your tum-tum. I really hope it wasn't a one and done. I needed it in my life. And they just smashed each other, because of course they did, with Danielson stomping on a Carter's knees, which is not a thing. But the Rainmaker doesn't take kindly to that, and he knows what he's doing. Because they fought to the outside, and he saw Brian. He just booted him into the crowd. Why not? Danielson fought back by using Rita the ring post and just flew off the apron with this kind of knee dive thingamajig. But you do not do this to the former IWGP heavyweight champion. Because he just brushed this all off. He did a drop kick to the outside when, yes, they essentially assaulted Barry Barricade. Now, this did actually happen a lot throughout this show, but this video is running well too long, so bring it down 71. They also hit Barry so hard they went flying over the top of him. And when they got back in the squared circle, Akada hit this disgusting looking air raid crash. And let's not forget, this is Brian Danielson we're talking about. He had to retire. I almost got in a car and drove to Canada to say to Akada, what are you doing? Some people even tweeted tweeted me saying this match was underwhelming. We must have been watching different things. Your expectations were well too high, especially because then Akada became the dropkick king. Does anybody throw a better one than him? No, they don't. We also had some Rainmaker attempts, but Danielson got out of that and he applied the Abel lock. And you need to keep that in your brain. It's important for later. Nothing was phasing Akada at all, though. So he tombstone Brian onto the ring apron. Once again, I was going to travel down there. Which meant when we did get back in the ring, Brian Danielson was out of it to the point a doctor was here going, man, it doesn't look good. Now, for some reason, the doctor just went, nah, don't worry about it. And he let him continue. But actually, Danielson was playing possum. I was like, what's the doctor in on this? What a ruse. He did get up from the dead, though, and hit this amazing knee when everybody was down. And when they got back up, Akada actually hit the Rainmaker, and Brian Danielson got out of it. I genuinely couldn't believe it. At this stage, too, Brian only had one arm, as the commentators kept telling us. But given that Akada was also flubbed up, he started to apply the label lock, but he was struggling, because, again, he's a one-armed man. Due to this, though, Brian somehow went all Sack Sabre Jr., and he kind of wrapped his legs around Akada, and it was the most filthy looking thing you've ever seen in your life. I was like, there's no way Akada's gonna tap out. He hasn't tapped out, I think, since like 2015 when he took on Nakamura, and my word, he did. And just go and listen to this crowd, they were stunned into silence. I thought it was brilliant though, because one, it made Brian Danielson look an absolute badass, but it also means that we're gonna get a round two probably in Japan. Look at me, I'm hooking it to my veins, I need it in my life. People are already going, well, I thought Omega versus Osprey was better, but who cares about that, man? On this one show, I got pizza and ice creams. I was having the best day ever, to the point, that's right, I'm breaking my own damn system. It doesn't just get an up, it gets a golden up. Do you understand how hard it is to pull off some of the things they did? It's non impossible, and they doing it like it's eating cake. What a terrific pay-per-view. This did bring us to the end of the show, and surprise, surprise, it is going to get an up. And even if you want to watch these two incredible main events, it will be worth it alone. And look, on the screen right now, ups and downs for AEW Collision. So if you do want to travel back in time, you can. Also, please do like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Go to whatcoach.com, where we'll keep you up to date with all of the fallout. And come say hey to me on social media at Simon316. And say hey to what culture at what culture WWE. My name is Simon from What Culture. I fly in love professional wrestling. I cannot believe we get these crossover shows and they just give you everything you want. Shouldn't be thrusting. Goodbye.